Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are as you join us today. My name is Timothy Cheek, and as the director for the Center for Chinese Research at the Institute of Asian Research and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, I am pleased to welcome you to this second session of the 2021 22 CCR Symposium, Seeing Like an Empire, Chinese Political Thought and Practice in Changing Times. First, I would like to acknowledge that those of us at uh, the UBC Vancouver campus are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are honored to live and work here. This symposium covers a wide range of periods and topics from the imperial period to Xi Jinping's China. We look at Chinese political thought through the lens of new sinology by taking thought and experience from the last two millennia seriously in its own right and putting it into conversation with 20th century political thought and practice in China and their further developments today. For those who wonder what the contemporary or policy relevance of traditional Chinese history might be, I refer you to the historical resolution of the sixth plenum of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party passed in November 2021, and to the pronouncements of General Secretary Xi Jinping. Regardless of what we may think of official versions of political history, perhaps one point of agreement with the General Secretary is on the importance today of studying history. Our first guest for the symposium today, our, for this second symposium, is Dr. Vivian Xu. She is Professor Emeritus, Emerita of Contemporary China Studies at the University of Oxford and a fellow of the British Academy. Before moving to Oxford to head a new research program there in 2002, she taught Chinese politics to undergraduates and graduates in Cornell University and Yale University for more than 25 years. She has written widely on the topics of, in 20th and 21st century Chinese politics, political economy, society, and history, with special interests in local government, changing institutions, uh, and the practices of the party state, techniques of political legitimization, and patterns of state society interactions. Dr. Xu is perhaps best known for her seminal study, Reach of the State, which I still assign to my students and is necessary for their training. And her more recent publications include To Govern China, Evolving Practices of Power, co-authored with Patricia Thornton and uh, published by Cambridge in 2017. And finally, Party State, Nation, Empire, Rethinking the Grammar of Chinese Governance in the Journal of Chinese Governance in 2018. Professor Xu's lecture today is entitled, Like Spring Drizzle Falling Without a Sound, Xi Jinping and the Political Aesthetics of Empire. This draws from her most recent article published just last month in the journal Modern China. She introduces certain notable features in the political aesthetics of Chinese Communist Party rule under Xi Jinping today, placing those into longer and fuller historical perspective recalling successive transformations in the communication technologies available to political leaders pursuing propaganda work over the past century, her analysis highlights the almost unceasing strenuous efforts of the party to radiate its own positive spirit outward over the people, to sustain a keen sensation of dynamic social energy and purpose. Zhang Nengliang. This is meant to permeate the hearts and minds of people in all corners of the realm, generating through a process akin to sympathetic resonance, a word that we will hear more about, a, and to produce that resonance, a vibrantly charged hum of popular recognition, assent, and appreciation for the party's leadership and direction. This distinctive model of political legitimation, she argues, borrows its inspiration from concepts and practices of political authority first articulated in the cosmological frames of very early Chinese thought, later refined and augmented over the centuries of imperial governing practice, 
all quite intentionally being revived under Xi Jinping today. Our commentator, who I'll introduce now, is Dr. Shofu Yin, who is assistant professor of history at the University of British Columbia. His research and teaching center on inner Asian and political culture and thought in global historical contexts, based on primary research in the late medieval and early modern periods. Specializing in areas where cultural history meets comparative philosophy, he works on a wide array of previously unknown, untapped, and understudied sources in different languages, literary Sinic, literary Chinese or classical Chinese, Korean, Manchu, Mongolian, Persian, Latin, and Greek. Ultimately, his scholarly passion lies in writing new kinds of global intellectual histories that foreground theoretical contributions of both canonical and everyday thinkers of different traditions. His current book manuscript offers a new narrative history of the early modern political thought by examining the rhetorical curriculum that flourished in East Eurasia. So today we have kindred spirits indeed. And now let us begin with Dr. Vivian Shu. Vivian. Well, hello everyone. It's very good to be with you. And um, please, before anything else, just let me express my grateful thanks to Timothy Cheek uh, for the very fulsome introduction and also for his enthusiastic invitation to come to UBC by Zoom, as it has turned out to have to be, to speak with you all today and to endeavor to summarize for you this new research paper that I think Tim has just already uh, summarized, uh, an earlier draft of which uh, Tim did ask if I'd share with him some months back. I say summarize the paper because it is a pretty lengthy one. And even with uh, the very generous time allowance um, uh, that's given to me uh, today, for this talk, there's no way I think I can do full justice to all the paper's many parts. So my hope for today's presentation will be instead just to try to interest you enough in the topic and the approach that you might go and seek the full paper out for yourselves. It is now in preprint and available for download online. If you go to the homepage of the journal Modern China, which is published by Sage Journals, Sage as in Confucius the Sage, and click where it says online first. You should find it there under the title, Regimes of Resonance, Cosmos Empire and Changing Technologies of CCP Rule. But for now, let me start off instead from the title I elected to lend it just for purposes of today's symposium. It's part of a quotation, which I'll just read. Like spring drizzle falling without a sound, we should disseminate the core socialist values in a gentle and lively way by making use of all kinds of cultural forms. We should inform the people by means of fine literary works and artistic images. What is the true, the good, and the beautiful? What is the false, the evil, and the ugly? And what should be praised and encouraged? And what should be opposed? and repudiated. Now, these are Xi Jinping's words, spoken at a study session of the Chinese Communist Party's Central Committee's Politburo, almost exactly eight years ago. That speech, like so many of his speeches, bears a title written in the imperative mood, cultivate and disseminate the core socialist values. The speech contains, in fact, almost nothing at all about socialism, stressing instead the richness of traditional Chinese culture, values, ethics, and aesthetics, among which he lists benevolence, concern for the people, righteousness, integrity, the pursuit of common ground, and of concord. With his classical poetical allusion to a soaking spring rain that releases latent life energies from underground, and in a miracle of nature, turns the earth green all around, she expresses what he obviously regards as one of the most vital roles the party has to play. 
that of embracing, extending, encouraging, and promoting all those forms of cultural expression and creativity deemed to be fitting and worthy, and using these to saturate the public atmosphere, drench the entire social landscape, and sink its virtues and truths deep into people's hearts and minds, thus releasing and inspiring them to grow there, as it were, vigorously and luxuriantly upward and always bending toward the light. The party Chairman C has been saying for some years now can't settle for merely getting people to listen and obey. It must continuously strive instead to touch people's hearts with the truth and the beauty of the party's ideals and its mission, stirring people not to meager compliance or to begrudging deference, nor even to just willing consent, but inspiring in them instead ardent positive sensations of resonance with the party's call, a profound wish for themselves to be part of the party's good work. Xi Jinping, or so it seems to me, is envisioning an affinity between party and people that is rooted neither in the realm of materialism or self-interest, nor in that of plain logic or cognition, but rather in a sphere of experience more exquisite than these, something tender, transcendent, even spiritual. And that's a bit out of the ordinary, don't you think? For the head of what is, after all, a political party, a ruling party now in power unopposed for more than seven decades. That's longer even than Queen Elizabeth has held the monarch's throne here in Britain. So where precisely has this preoccupation of Xi Jinping's with what we may look upon as the sublime in the connection of party to people, where has this come from? I have to ask myself. Being a student of Chinese politics and society for so very many years now, I've had pretty much practice at tracing changes over time in both political ideology and in political organization. And in some of the work I've done on problems of political legitimation over recent years, I've also tried to grapple historically, analytically, with what we might call Chinese political values. Only with appearance of Xi Jinping, though, have I finally begun to think it really could be important to pay closer attention also to the political aesthetics of party rule. Now, some like to refer to this realm of study as symbolic politics, but I feel more comfortable not confining myself to symbols, but thinking more broadly about an assortment of political stylistics and grouping these under a heading I hope may come across as a more fluid and freewheeling concept, a concept of comparative political aesthetics. Appropriating this label to refer to all the distinguishing styles, tropes, and sensibilities we find recurring, adapting and morphing always, of course, and yet persisting over time within a given political system and in ways we ought to be able to compare across systems. Ideology, organization, values, these are all absolutely essential components in any system of governance, of course. They are essential to how well or poorly a system performs and to how well or poorly it succeeds in legitimizing itself to its people. But the symbolic, ritual, aesthetic, and stylistic components of governing also count for much in the lived experiences, perceptions, and memories of those being governed. That's what I, anyway, would want to argue. And so that's what I resolved to keep my focus on in this new paper uh, that I'm going to try to summarize for you today, which grew initially, as I say, out of a simple desire to get a better answer for myself to that question I just posed about the origins or the wellsprings of Xi Jinping's preoccupation with promoting and sustaining a sublime connection of party to people. Now to solve the puzzle of Xi Jinping's stylistics, some analysts uh, of Beijing high politics might, I suppose, be inclined to go the route of 
attributing Xi's insistence on the importance of China's traditional culture and aesthetics to the influence of one or more people in his inner circle, and not least likely, perhaps, to the influence of his wife of more than 30 years. She is, of course, the hugely popular Chinese folk artist, soprano Peng Liyuan, whose name incidentally translates as beauty. In 2014, just at the very time she was delivering that short speech to the Politburo that I was just reading from, it happens that Forbes magazine did, after all, list Peng as the 57th most powerful woman in the world, noting that whilst holding the military rank of Major General, she was then also President of the People's Liberation Army Academy of Art. But I was quite sure I'd observed a similarly intense anxiety and concern about just which aspects of traditional culture, arts, and aesthetics should be respected and which repudiated in previous party chairmen, not all of them so felicitously married to folk artists as she. And then too, I was also quite sure I'd encountered much similar concern with culture and aesthetics as well in pre-communist, republican era, and imperial era Chinese political thought and action. So I felt there were going to have to be many, many widely disparate dots I would need to try to connect in my explanatory analysis. And for that, I was going to need to look a good deal more broadly than just at other contemporary Communist Party cultural critics, philosophers, and potentates, and much farther back in time than to Xi Jinping's choice of a mate. It was, I suppose, the sense of deja vu I had, an intuition that there were dots to be connected that were spread out across long spans of time that caused me to resort to the somewhat unorthodox format used in the paper, which it first takes a very deep dive back to early Chinese thought, to cosmology, philosophy, ritual, and aesthetics, giving some special attention to music in particular, so as to review certain key conceptions and representations of universal order that we do find embedded in ancient Chinese thought. And then it takes a long leap forward in time again to consider more closely and critically just how and why some of these very early concepts and practices of ordering can be rediscovered, repeatedly reproduced, imitated, or echoed, if you like, in what we take to be everyday norms and habits of Communist Party governance. Habits of governance dating from the party's early days in mid 20th century modern times, right up to today in these our 21st century postmodern times. So the first section of the paper, which is about what I call the cosmic frame, argues that from very early times, a set of distinctive aesthetics for legitimating authority and for projecting that authority over the realm was assembled and that these aesthetics were then honed and refined through centuries of dynastic ebb and flow, solemnly observed and reperformed through rituals of rule and regulation of the realm, even unto the very last, the Manchu epic of empire, which remained in place until it was finally swept away in the revolution of 1911. This long-lived and distinctive aesthetic of empire, I wish to stress, put much emphasis on ritual, on schematics of hierarchy, of encompassing and centering, all of which it exhibited, at least in part, through elaborate systems of spatial ordering. This aesthetic was also distinctive for the emphasis it also put on attentiveness to timing, time keeping, time telling, proper pacing and synchronicity. So what I'm calling the aesthetic of empire also, I wish to stress, puts special emphasis on ideas and beliefs about radiance and about the generation of sympathetic resonance over the realm. This condition of sympathetic resonance being both a means and a yardstick of right rule. 
Now, this notion of generating and radiating sympathetic resonance is, I think, central to understanding the overall argument. So let me just actually read for you a short passage from the paper itself in which I've tried to capture how I believe we can most usefully think about this concept of resonance as a force, a desirable one, applicable in governance and in politics. The passage draws an analogy with the phenomenon of sympathetic resonance that we encounter in the performance of music. When a harp is well tuned and a harpist plays just one simple four note chord on it, for example, every one of the other strings on the harp will come into sympathetic resonance, producing a light consonant hum that deepens and uplifts supports and enhances the depth and harmony of the chord. If she then muffles the original four strings and stops them vibrating, all the other strings will continue their gentle vibration for quite some time until finally all sound does die away. Given the many mediation, meditations and disputations on the relation of music to morality and to power that philosophers of politics and social governance in early China left in the records passed down to us, the suggestion is that the harmony they aspired to achieve in human affairs was not, as often supposed today, straightforward unanimity, but instead a phenomenon of sympathetic resonance akin to that familiar to musicians and their audiences. So that's a first important starting point. And a second important point that's developed in this first section of the paper on the cosmic frame concerns how contemporary Chinese historians understand the emperor in imperial political thinking to have been symbolically constructed and positioned as an axis or pivot of the cosmos. The cosmos itself being construed as a vast and interpenetrated sphere of action and cross-action, which encompass both the natural world and a supernatural one. And this supernatural world potentially including a multitude of gods, ancestors, spirits, demons, ghosts, and other forces, any or all of which could be capable of influencing, for better or worse, the lives of individual men and women, entire families or clans, and even the course of events for whole human societies and polities. The emperor as pivot, historians today teach us, occupied a position in cosmic space-time that was akin to the emptiness at the point where the spokes of a wheel join. Chinese emperors, that is, were believed to personify the one space-time locus at which all the infinite oppositions inherent in the cosmos came into proximity and dynamically interacted with one another. The emperor, who was understood to be the single socket, sort of, for sublime connectivity in a universe otherwise intensely charged with contradictions, the emperor played the role of open portal, of sacred void, rather like a hollow conduit through which the will of heaven might enter, reverberate on through, and resonate with earth and nature and humanity and by extension also reverberating even into the realm of more purely mundane and political or geopolitical matters. So the emperor was likewise conceived as the pivot point resting atop the entire expanse of the realm or the polity. The one point at which diverse compositions of power contested and constrained one another yet could be united within a complex hierarchy and dynamic process of interaction. Now, to be sure, both in imperial times and also after the fall of empire, there were some other less deeply mystical, but also very familiar and well-practiced stylistics, alternative aesthetics, if you wish, that could be deployed by contenders for power in China. 
when staking their claims to worthiness, uprightness, and the authority to rule. And some of these styles, too, were to make occasional appearances in later CCP ruling practices, especially, I'd say, during some of the more challenging periods of Mao Zedong's long tenure as party chairman. But the task I took for this paper was to try to trace and demonstrate what I anyway thought to be the curiously ironic fact that in its public rituals, its propaganda work, and its other signature elements of political legitimation, the CCP, with the exception only of the period when Deng Xiaoping was at the helm, would most reliably opt to redeploy tools pretty plainly adapted, adapted from and making echoing references to that much older cosmically conceptualized imperial toolkit. So from there on, the paper leaps forward in time again and proceeds chronologically, looking at the repertoire of CCP governing techniques and its aesthetic, aesthetics of rulership, beginning first when the CCP was still at war in wartime, and then for more than 25 years under Mao, and still later under Deng, and then finally on to today, all the while keeping the spotlight on party practices of ordering space, marking time and potent political messaging and propaganda diffusion. That is what I interpret as party practices of resonance. The paper's analysis over all these periods calls attention first to recurrent CCP exercises of boundary making over territorial and geographical spaces, as well as over and ordering human social spaces. It looks, secondly, at party rituals of marking the passage of time and at projects of synchronizing and pacing the times of both public, ceremonial, and mundane, personal, even private life. And a third very important strand in the discussion traces the party's almost unceasingly strenuous efforts to radiate its own energy, its positive spirit, outward via incessant rounds of intense propaganda and thought work, making use always of quite rapidly changing technologies for mass communication over the years in order to cause that spirit of the party to penetrate into and resonate over all times, places, and social spaces within the orbit of its rule. The paper is organized, therefore, first to recall, so that we can see them in a very concentrated way, the really wide range and the determined persistence of party state projects of ordering and reordering, of timekeeping, time telling, and of energetic propaganda messaging from its very, very early revolutionary days through to today. And then second, to bring into better focus so as to weigh the impacts of the simply staggering advances over time in the communications technologies available to the party in pursuit of this repertoire of governing practices. And all the while relating these distinctive party techniques of mass management, political messaging and performance of legitimate political authority to what's become what I think many now see as the conspicuously empire-like constellation of rulership styles and logics that has crystallized, and emphatically so, under Xi Jinping. The section of the paper on the CCP during wartime makes just a couple of observations I want to take time to note. The first concerns Mao's formulation, Mao Zedong's formulation, during that very early period of his celebrated mass line leadership style. That is Mao's formula for the party's performance of what he called correct leadership. I hope most of you are already familiar with this key uh, aspect of how the party conceived its tasks in making revolution. If you remember the passage, uh, it's from the masses to the masses. That's the passage I'm thinking of. I make a point in the text of deconstructing the elements that were composed within this Maoist mass line st style in order to illustrate how, in essence, those elements so very closely paralleled the elements present in the Ancien Regime rights of ordering. It did this by 
first gathering in and centering energy, and then by sifting and purifying it, then radiating it and making it resonant in everyday life. In Mao's reformulation, as Republican socialism demanded, of course, a ruler's inspiration was no longer to be caught on the winds of a divine cosmos, but was to be found imminent instead in the ideas or thoughts of the masses. With Mao, it was not just the emperor and his court anymore, but the party which assumed the pivotal position around which all else revolves, turning itself into the sacred void within which the will was to be condensed, reflected, and then caused to resonate across the realm. And with Mao, of course, it wasn't the will of heaven that was gathered up any longer, but the will of the people instead. And not in accord with celestial time anymore, but in historical material time. Yet still, Communist Party time was not exactly parallel to Western concepts of linear historical time, because time was imagined by Mao, as time was also imagined in the Book of Changes, as unfolding not in a straight line forward, but in the form of an endless spiral. In this part of the paper's discussion also, though, I do stress how challenging it must have been for the party to formulate its messages in ways that the masses, who are mostly illiterate rural people, could relate to and understand. Party and army activists in the 1930s and 40s had little choice but to rely primarily on word of mouth. So they worked hard at adapting already familiar local popular cultural forms to their purposes. They composed new wartime lyrics for traditional folk songs, for example, carrying news from the front and encouraging solidarity with the party, its army, and the revolution. These songs were taught to children and adults and popularized in live performances, operas, and other amateur, uh, amateur uh, theatricals, most of them conducted outdoors, and as with as many as possible uh, of the public encouraged to take a part. The Red Army was, I think, indicatively really quite famous for singing uh, when it was marching. Party political and military leaders had little capacity to undertake major projects of spatial reordering, construction, or engineering during those rugged wilderness years. But they certainly did work diligently at altering ordinary people's experiences of time, the aim often being that of filling up and saturating public time, the free time of soldiers, farmers, villagers, townspeople, by bringing them together in busily creative group activities and organizing them, organizing them to perform as actors and as audiences, and sometimes also during land reform campaigns, to perform in what were known as speak bitterness sessions, targeting landlords and rich peasants, performing their own sympathetic resonance with the party's agenda for revolution. Well, moving on from wartime to the early PRC, the paper points out that in October 1949, when Mao Zedong ascended the gate of heavenly peace to proclaim the founding of the People's Republic, the weather-beaten grandeur of the imperial backdrop that was chosen for the ceremony, it must have encouraged the public realization that almost all the territories once governed by the last emperor had at long last been reunited again under a single pivotal authority. Accentuating the imperial spatial reunion, time keeping too was reunified. China's five different time zones were collapsed into one at that juncture, officially putting all the former territories of empire back again on Beijing time. Under Mao, as I imagine you will already know, CCP projects of spatio-temporal reordering quite quickly became far more ambitious than that. The entire social order, the very map of society as such, was first of all reconceived primarily in terms of class rather than earlier 
uh, as in earlier, it was in terms of family, gender, lineage, locality, and the like. Rural spaces were reorganized into collectives and then communes. Urban spaces into separate cell-like work units or danwe. With the introduction of the household registration system after 1958, every Chinese household and each individual was attached to a specific rural or urban place to live and work. Traveling to other localities became nearly impossible for most without express permission. In schools and urban Danway, the day often dawned with group calisthenics performed in time to march music broadcast over loudspeakers, and it ended with the playing of the national anthem before lights out. By the late 1950s, wristwatches, along with bicycles and sewing machines, were promoted as must-have consumer items for urban dwellers. Party propaganda workers, moving from place to place, strove to saturate communes, urban work units, and schools with enthusiastic messages promoting diligent labor and study. Still, communication technologies remained really quite primitive. 30 years after liberation in 1979, when I was able to do a little field work of my own on the matter, even radios were still scarce in the Chinese countryside. And most rural communes, in, uh, even in better off agricultural areas, were still dependent on wired public address systems for their news and entertainment. Still, once a standard system of simplified Chinese characters had been introduced and popular literacy was advanced, bulletin boards had proliferated and political slogans were painted just everywhere. So, so this section of the paper on the Mao years concludes with the observation that whereas Qing Dynasty emperors uh, as they reenacted ritual after ritual in the temples of Beijing, had imagined themselves radiating a splendidly transcendent, stabilizing and harmonizing cosmic authority across a realm of astonishingly different cultures and peoples, inhabiting different linguistic, religious and cultural place times, the party under Mao had instead sought quite literally and materially to standardize the time, space, and culture of the nation. So moving on then to the Deng Xiaoping period, 1978 to 1993-ish. I guess I have already hinted um, an awful lot of the space-time political ordering that I've just described was dramatically altered then in a blindingly brisk 15 years time under Deng, and not by any means always for the better. It's my reading of the Deng interlude that I imagine is likely to elicit the most pushback from Western China specialists, especially from economists and political scientists who, who generally have only praise for the reforms he ushered in, like the introduction of freer markets and the insistence on term limits for political power holders and such. But from within the frame I'm using in this paper, it's a much more mixed picture that comes through. Deng's daring departures released previously stifled energies and generated great ambition and created undreamt of opportunities and concentrations of wealth for some in some trades and some government, government delineated, mostly coastal, special economic zones. This is for sure. Meanwhile, however, other zones, enterprises, industrial sectors, and whole great regions of the country were left on their own to catch up, adjust, and survive as best they could. By actively encouraging novel, uneven spaces and paces for development to emerge, the party center under Deng forfeited some of its capacity to radiate a common message overall and to make that message credibly resonant everywhere and for everyone. The consequent exceedingly uneven unraveling of what had been long prevailing social orderings generated protracted social dislocation and pronounced new forms of exploitation 
and inequity, along with ferocious urban sprawl, environmental degradation, and incalculable instances of corruption. As there were few, of, if any, effective remedies for these unfamiliar forms of social suffering as yet set in place, the fundamental moral authority of the party center inevitably became more and more attenuated and was time and again, both covertly resisted and openly and angrily contested. Throughout the period also, unregulated construction of all kinds boomed raising huge concerns about sprawling land use patterns in a country with such an enormous population and a small percentage of its land that is actually arable. Towns haphazardly spread out to become small cities and the administrative capacities of cities were soon overwhelmed as rural migrant laborers flooded in seeking jobs. Society at large, now also unashamedly, became rapidly and visibly much more stratified. Previously universal styles and qualities of dress became diversified and differentiated. This was when high level political leaders made the switch from Mao suits to Western business suits and ties, you might recall. While at the same time, new rich town and village enterprise bosses, for example, were sporting leather jackets, gold neck chains and sunglasses. And at the same time, local level cadres, in contrast, started opting for a more sporty look, donning trainers and also ostentatiously carrying beepers with them wherever they went. A widespread obsession with gift giving and receiving took hold across this drastically destabilized social landscape. Gifts calculated to cultivate good relations, guanxi, with persons now suddenly in positions to provide favors and scarce resources. This was a period when I was spending a good deal of time in Chinese cities, large and small. And I can report that even the droning background music of party propaganda messaging seemed often to be simply drowned out then by the general clamor of social change. Sustaining the musical metaphor that runs through the paper, I take some space in this section to comment on how even the newly competing musical soundtracks of the times became so quickly and unexpectedly fragmented and jarring. As the now outmoded Mao era repertoire of folk revolutionary socialist songs was discarded, elderly folk, for example, seemed to most enjoy listening to Chinese opera on their radios, while youngsters hummed along to dreamy love songs coming in first on cassette tapes and then on combat discs from pop idols in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Huge crowds of urban youths thrilled in those days to the provocative lyrics and electric guitars at sold out concerts by the controversial rock musician Sui Jian. Middle-aged office workers crooned out their own favorite ballads late into the night with friends at karaoke bars. And as for foreign businessmen and tourists who in greater and greater numbers at that time began passing conspicuously through China's international airports, lodging and dining in its most upscale hotels and shopping in its shiniest new malls, well, they may have felt they could just never get away from the ingratiating tunes of easy listening global megastars like the affable French pianist Richard Kleiderman, who became wildly popular in the PRC. He has a website even today where you can listen to his greatest hits if you're not familiar. Meanwhile, too, though, China's conservatories were already gearing up and training some of the coming generation's finest young uh, classical musicians, such as another far more ebullient pianist, Lang Lang, who in 1994, at the age of just 12, took top prize in his first international piano competition. Well, bottom line takeaway from this reminiscing about the music of those times is that the performance of authority, of popularity, and of power in China was, in short, 
becoming decidedly disjointed through the 1980s and 90s, a period that also saw repeated, sometimes profoundly threatening popular challenges to the party's own moral substance. The standout political crises that had to be weathered, of course, were the Tiananmen Square protests and their suppression in 1989, and then the Falun Gong protests and their suppression in 1999. These were the protests everyone now still remembers. But by the end of the century, popular protests about real problems in towns and cities here, there, and everywhere around the country was rapidly becoming a way of life. Many who looked on from the outside then came to believe that the center could not possibly hold in Beijing. This was the general view, I think. But ceding the party's monopoly on power had never been part of Deng's plan, I think. Projects of modernizing and vastly upping the party's own governance game, upping it intellectually, technologically, stylistically, professionally, these projects had already been well advanced before Deng left the scene, and they were carried out just as vigorously by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, the two party chairmen who followed him. All that dramatic modernizing and upscaling to global standards eventually would embolden party center to return again around the turn of the millennium to projects of truly comprehensive spatial reordering, and this time on a far grander scale in pursuit of ever more ambitious programs for things like poverty alleviation, population resettlement, and future-proofed sustainable patterns of accelerated urbanization and rural reorganization. So while the party and its authority were time and again very sorely challenged by economic distortions and social disorders largely of its own making throughout this period of more than another 30 years, and while it was openly mistrusted, the party, by most, even publicly mocked and scorned by many, it never relinquished its character and its role as sacred source of legitimate authority. It most certainly never went into hiding or sequestered itself from public view. On the contrary, I can recall, it was all too drearily visible to everyone all the time on television, which was then the newest medium of communications, Winter or summer, in good times and in worse, there was the party performing its rituals within its scrupulously observed hierarchies of rule, convening meetings and congresses, giving speeches and taking notes, greeting dignitaries, making inspection tours, issuing reports, and forever releasing what it had now started referring to as its important public service messages. All this while, however, in the sobering wake of what today gets glossed as the collapse of communism and the dissolution of the Soviet empire, an urgent quest was on in Chinese leading circles, as in other Asian socialist states like Vietnam and Laos, and in many of the new post-Soviet republics that stretched over Eurasia from Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan to Belarusia and the Ukraine, a quest for a viable political cultural form and purpose and a matching aesthetic to suit the greatly altered post-Soviet bloc geopolitical realities each new one of these states and societies faced. In China, this intellectual quest would swell quickly and intensify into a veritable fever for national studies, Guo Xue Re. Even before the Soviet debacle, recoiling from the extreme calls for wholesale westernization that had been made by some liberal intellectual critics and leaders during the democracy movement, other thinkers and cultural workers had already begun the tasks of reassembling out of China's own past ethical frames and philosophical traditions what they hoped could become more recognizably cynic sets of practices and aesthetics for a modernizing moral political authority that was no longer going to be rooted in proletarian revolutionary ideals. This 
elite retrieval and recuperation of ancient civilizational codes and imperial sensibilities and values reached something of a stunning culmination in the party's very public re-embrace of the teachings of Confucius in the early 2000s. Now, it's at this point in the paper's historical narrative that I thought the best way to capture the extent and the nature of the unfolding political aesthetic shift that was already quite advanced by the early 2000s would be by attempting to decode or deconstruct, according to my own understanding at least, just two of the monumentally signifying aesthetic performances of party authority that were designed and presented to the public in those transitional times. This was a risky choice for me, I'd like to confess, since I have no training whatsoever as a culture, arts, or media studies scholar. But anyway, I did have lots of fun trying to flag up all the many messages I did think I could see encoded within these um, two extraordinary public art creations. The first one is the really amazing monument that was opened to the public by Jiang Zemin as part of the nation's celebration of the turn of the millennium. I don't know how many of you may already have had a chance to tour this site, but with its overt reprise and salute to the very symbology of what I've been calling the ancient cosmic frame in its conception and its design mo motifs, so unapologetically incorporating references to so many of its mystically potent components, such as heaven, earth, fire, water, and metal, and also throwing into that mix the discovery of Peking man, well, I think it made quite a statement. The first building in Beijing to be constructed in the shape of an altar since the Ming dynasty, it so jubilantly blended these early cosmic elements, along with other sets of space-time ordering motifs, which Empire had so long deployed, all together with futuristic allusions to state-of-the-art, highest tech, 21st century scientific discovery and wizardry, especially in astronomy and space exploration. In my own personal estimation, this building is not among the most graceful of Beijing's many monuments, but A plus, I did think, for chancing such an audacious and imaginative public leap back to the future. The second back to the future performance of authority that I take a stab at dissecting from that era is, as you might well have guessed in this Olympic season, um, it was the jaw-dropping opening ceremony of the 2008 Beijing Olympics, which in director Zhang Yimou's hands was even more deeply and powerfully encoded with messages about the new postmodern China that was emerging so proudly and proficiently out of its own carefully curated version of its venerable and glorious past. It was a lengthy performance, but if you didn't see it yourself or or if, as I imagine, some of you may have watched it, but have been so young in 2008 that you don't really remember it so well now, a video of it is still available online. And I do, I do heartily recommend you sit down, maybe with a glass of cider and some peanuts, and just take it all in. There isn't uh, time uh, to go over all the performances, many space-time ordering features, and its utilizations of resonance not only musical resonance, but also optical resonance, as in laser lighting. But suffice it to say that, that flawlessly synchronized movements executed by multitudes of identically costumed performers, that formed the major motifs of the action. And just as in the Millennium Monument, China's past was once more represented as an uninterrupted, smooth and progressive historical flow, one containing no remembered episodes of conquest, conflict or struggle, or any other unpleasantness, no references at all to wars or famines, and none whatsoever to revolution. 
but with much attention given instead to Chinese arts and artisanship, technical invention and discovery, creative performance, calligraphy, the written and printed word, and to the sound of human voices declaiming texts and chanting. And just as with the Millennium Monument, all this recalling of the past was coupled with copious intimations of futuristic celestial exploration depicted through a vision of glowing cosmic peace and harmony. All great stuff. And even though Premier Hu Jintao, who presided as host that evening, showed little emotion as usual, we must assume he was gratified to witness such a meticulously edited narrative of the nation which was concocted on his watch, represented to the world with such stylish conviction and flair, and without any noticeable technical glitches. While Hu Jintao remained at the top, pursuing what became an ever more bureaucratic style of leadership that was deeply informed by the contributions of technical experts and specialists, the wider public craze for national studies had continued running its course. And Confucius, the rehabilitated sage, who under Mao, you, you will remember, had been coupled so ignominiously with Lin Biao, the traitor, for public calumny, Confucius by then had made it firmly back into the good graces of the party state. And with all the emphasis then being put by Beijing on science and on technical proficiency and managerial efficiency, it was looking for a time I thought, as if it really might be China's latter-day Confucian literati, its rising engineers, systems designers, and civil service exam-tested technocrats who were destined to inherit the mantle of revolution after all, once more presiding learnedly over the land. Which brings us to Xi Jinping. Well, with so much of the remedial recuperation of imperial era political symbols and sensibilities already accomplished by the party under Jiang and Hu. It really remained to Xi Jinping, starting from 2012 when he took the party chairmanship, it remained to him only to double down and reinforce this domestically. Although I do see him and many of those who work closely with him as having pressed on still farther to recover the very legitimacy of empire itself and to apply that frame in working out key elements of China's contemporary international posture and approaches to global affairs. Still, useful as this imperial style posture may or may not now turn out to be in pursuit of China's enlarging international agenda, it's important to keep in mind, I think, that Xi began first and foremost, to secure the new ethos of his premiership at home and with a crusade against corruption of all kinds within the party ranks, making his very top priority one of cleaning and polishing the public's perception of the CCP, which with that vessel, we can now see it was his intention to set forth again as the sacred space at the heart of China's political system. As his second domestic political priority, Xi then also set to work on some serious recentering of energy, purpose, and potency within that party and in himself. Notoriously becoming chairman of everything, he systematically reconfigured the hierarchies of party, government, and army so that all bureaucratic reporting lines ultimately converged with him. Which is to say that one plausible way to comprehend what Xi Jinping has been striving for is the recreation of that positioning in the polity which was once presumed to be held by emperors. The imperial position now to recall again was not primarily one of exerting individual dictatorial control as such, no but rather one of personifying in himself the one space-time locus at which all the infinite oppositions inherent in the universe of forces at play came into proximity and dynamically interacted with each other. The one point at which diverse compositions, 
of power contested and constrained one another, yet could be united. The one place in space-time akin to the emptiness where the spokes of a wheel join. That imperial positioning, importantly, was not at all analogous to the sort of personal magnetism or charisma that we would associate today with a modern authoritarian cult of personality. Because from that ultimately hollow position of supreme centering, symbolically capturing the distilled energy of all forces at play, the emperor's chief task and responsibility as governor had never been to gather up popular support for himself. It was, on the contrary, to radiate and resonate the positive energy that was painstakingly concentrated within him over all his realm. And so, accordingly, taking his inspiration, I believe, from that imperial blueprint for rule, benign, harmonious rule over an always lively and animated, yet wholly non-adversarial polity, is from that um, that C, uh, from that inspiration, I think, that C has been such a robust proponent of the CCP, CCP's back to the future political stylistics. C leads the party in borrowing any and all uh, traditional aesthetics that can be made to resonate and marrying these with any and all of the latest, most potently penetrating communications technologies that come to hand, such as these wondrous 5G powered mobile phones, which have now been dropped so conveniently into everyone's pockets as instruments for soaking the sublime vitality concentrated within the party itself into the hearts of the people, just like spring drizzle falling without a sound onto the good earth all around. And with that, um, I Thank think so I'm very to much. turn things back to Tim. Thank you so Thank very you much, so very Vivian. Much. That's a powerful, powerful lecture. And my mind is just spinning. Uh, with the, the latest one being, it's not about cult of personality. And yet the focus on she, it's wonderful. The, he is the empty conduit, my goodness. And of course, I'm gonna come back later to ask you about Li Zhou Ho and uh, the uh, Kantian aesthetics. But we get to have a more informed commentary first. And that is from Professor uh, Shofu Yin, who, as uh, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning, uh, is uh, a new professor here at uh, UBC in our Department of History, uh, working on what we would call um, uh, late medieval and early modern history, but with a very strong global perspective and contemporary engagement. Shofu, I turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tim, for the introduction. And um, thank you so much, um, Professor Shu, for such a um, fantastic illuminating um, lecture. As uh, the space and time is organized in my place, you can see uh, the sun, I'm basked in the sun, but I'm more basked in your lecture. And I have um, um, your, lab, your, your talk has a lot of um, resonance for me. It's such a rich lecture. I think, I believe um, many of our audience like me are digesting such a rich talks. So I'd like to organize my, um, my, my, my comments um, in three parts properly. The first, um, at the broadest level, I would like to share my take um, on the conceptual framework of the political aesthetics of empire specifically. Um, second, um, I'd like to um, zoom in on um, discussing a little bit more about how this framework helps us understand um, Chinese political reality, helps us um, make sense of the shift, as you have wonderfully described, concerning the Chinese political reality in the recent past and also in terms of the long durée history. And um, in the end, um, the third part, I would like to um, broach three or four um, questions um, based on your lecture and also um, based on your paper. Um, so let me start. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the very intriguing idea of political aesthetics of empire. So my take is probably a, a little bit is idiosyncratic. I am way out of this, this field, but do correct me if I am wrong. When I first read um, Professor Shu's article, um, the, the, the framework, the term somehow reminds me of Walter Benjamin 
on the aestheticization of politics, which concerns how politics itself turns out to be a spectacle that traps the masses, not empowers them, but traps them in the sense that makes them feel that they are a part. But the more I think about them, the more I read about Professor Shu's article and I hear the lecture, I think Professor Shu is inviting us to take a step further, inviting us to think about a deeper dimension behind that. In a nutshell, it concerns what constitutes, what shapes, and what makes it possible, the everyday experience of being governed, of being under such a regime. Um, by the way, this reminds me, um, this is also a very interesting scene um, 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 with uh, many early Chinese texts. Um, 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 for instance, the documents, for instance, Xunzi, we can probably go back to that. Um, the emperor, the sage, as Professor Xu has wonderfully um, explained, impact is not so much about autocracy. It is about um, and, and the, the, the roots, the source that organize space and time in a way that everyday experience, political experience is possible. This is the canon of Yao. He gives a calendar so that the perception of time is possible. This is about Yu Gong, the division of space, so that perception of space is possible. And if we go to go on with Han Yu, we are born as humans, but as individuals, we do not know how to live. And as the sage kings, these emperors in the end, they set up rituals, rites, conceptual frameworks, normative frameworks is a result which life is possible, everyday experience is possible. At this point, um, I think Professor Shu, a wonderful contribution here is to point out that these dimensions are not obsolete. They are of pivotal importance in making sense of contemporary politics and its shift. Somehow it also reminds me of, um, the term aesthetics also reminds me, I don't know um, um, the, the, the composition of audience, how many of us read Kant, Emmanuel, the transcendental aesthetics chapter of the Kritik der Reine Vernunft. It is about what makes perceptual experience possible. It is about intuition of space, intuition of time, and the Indian conceptual categories. And I think Professor Shu offers us a wonderful framework of thinking about the making of everyday political experience from the perspective of spatiality, temporality, and resonance. With, the, this res, with this regard, I would like to zoom in a little bit on the concept of resonance, which is um, fantastic. Um, interestingly, um, Professor Shu did not mention today in the article, I think in today's lecture, definitely um, terms like indoctrination, propaganda, but emphasized instead the term resonance. I think it is very illuminating for me. Um, I, I can give a concrete example. For instance, indoctrination is that I teach you something, right? You are supposed to reproduce that. We can imagine that. Resonance seems to be a model that is somehow different. It means, for instance, I was sit there hearing a lecture like Xi Jinping's talk or Donald Trump's talk. When I was hearing them, I think it's cliched. It's old stuff. I, I, I don't feel that it's compelling, right? But at a certain point, after a while, I was reacting to certain things in a way that resonates to that. I think the model of radiance and resonance emphasize some, some, some constitutive dimensions of our experience that if we um, discuss it at a conscious level, we might say, no, it's not influencing me. I, I feel that political discourse is just cliched, or I do not, I have not paid much attention to their symbols, rituals, performance, music. If you ask me explicitly, I do not know how to explain that. And the resonance has a wonderful explanatory power of capturing these dimensions. The, sin, the center re radiates as such, it transforms us in a certain way that we are not fully conscious of. And I think the first step in the very depressing political reality of today is to making this mechanism explicit. I think with this regard, I'm personally particularly grateful to Professor Shu's article, which reveals this mechanism as such. With this, I would like to shift to um, the second topic. It, is, um, it concerns the framework, the framework of political aesthetics of empire as a way of understanding Chinese political reality of the present, of its past, 
and as a way of envisioning the um, future. I think it's particularly efficacious in helping us rethinking the question, what makes the shift possible? As Professor Shu mentioned, it's very swift, happens very fast, but what at all, at all is going on? I recall that um, during the past decades, a lot of works, as I, I, I study in the Department of History, in history, 20th century history, or imperial Chinese history, is more or less emphasizing a bifurcating model, if I may use that term, emphasizing the radical difference between late imperial mode of governance and 20th century China. So late imperial China, it is imperial ritual, emperor, being the center of a symbolic, symbolic system. State power being particularly weak, thanks to Robert Hartwell's research, and uh, we might hear more from Yu Hua's recent book. Because such state power is rich, uh, a weak, a county magistrate will sit over a huge population, and these kind of state capacity are particularly weak. So this symbolic ritual characterizes a late imperial and imperial way of governance as a result of which gentry elites, corporate lineages, they function as important to mediating kind of institutions. Power works through the cultural nexus, cultural nexus to use Dara's term. But 20th century, especially late 20th century is radically different. It is characterized by the making of disciplinary power, biopolitics, that is capable of reaching out to every individual. With that regard, the bifurcating view late imperial China and a modern or hypermodern Chinese state. It helps us to understand certain phenomena. For instance, what is the deeper mechanism behind Tiananmen, for instance, behind 1989? What is the deeper mechanism behind, for instance, the economic boom? that the state was capable of doing this and that to facilitate economic development. And we have various empirical studies as that, uh, concerning that. But this kind of model is making us difficult to understand what is actually going on in the recent years. What makes that swift, depressing shift possible? And what is behind that? And Professor Shu, I think, offers us an alternate way of thinking about that. It is more about a cumulative model in a certain sense. Cumulative in the sense that the imperial past was there in a certain way and resonates with us. And I like the term resonant also because it's not only about spatial, right? Uh, uh, the center resonates with different locales. It's also about temporality. The past resonates with the present. The past provides certain cultural forms, cultural repositories, as a, they, 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 they in the end embodies a Leviathan that utilize a hyper new powerful technology. The past is not dead. They resonates in a way that makes the new technologies of governance possible. It is a cumulative utilization of the imperial symbolism, imperial ritual, and modern and hyper modern technologies that is at stake. That is the reality that we are facing. So personally, I find this framework, framework particularly illuminating in, understand, in understanding various phenomena of recent past, of the past centuries, and potentially in, in, in re-envisioning the future. With that regard, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, gradually walk into the questions that I would like to consult um, Professor Xu. Um, probably, uh, maybe let me focus on four laws um, in light of today's lecture. The first, um, how to put it, the first concerns um, Professor Xu's wonderful treatment of um, early China. I think early China here functions in two ways. One is like the, a kind of past, a kind of roots, a kind of repository from which the current CCP or the modern state can draw resource power, can revitalize certain forms, can re kind of um, combine the, 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 the imperial technologies with modern technologies. There's another dimension in my view in terms of early China, especially in foot, footnote one in the paper. It is early China as a theory itself. Early China, for instance, the documents, the Xun's argument um, and premise, what well, the arguments that elaborate on um, the analogy between music, musical resonance, and the political resonance. 
So the question, to put it in a kind of blunt way, is um, to what extent do you think that these kind of early Chinese theoretical kind of framework is also applicable to other situations? Do you think that is explanatory power, for instance, of the documents of the Xunzi for contemporary China lies more in terms of the continuity, or it is more in terms that um, it can also help make sense of other political phenomena as well? Probably I could better elaborate that. Maybe we can go back to that later. With that regard, um, I would like to broach a second question. The second question concerns, um, we talk about radiance, we talk about resonance, we talk about the center. And I would like to ask a little bit more about the mechanism, how it works and how to locate the agency. Who designs the mechanism? Who are the uh, concrete personnel who designs these rituals? who makes these symbols possible, and how, for instance, a particular vision of imperial aesthetic, a particular vision of performance like Zhang Yimou 2008. Zhang Yimou is an expert in a certain sense, and the political power is another realm, right? What is the mechanism that they cooperate today and in imperial times? I'm very curious about that for a specific reason. Because in, in period times, the making of ritual is a very uh, an interesting process. It is something uh, Michael Nyland and I recently wrote on with the Cambridge History of Democracy. So very often in the designing of rituals, a majority rule applies. Um, so which ritual shall we do? We hold a conference and we vote and the majority one um, get chosen. So it's an interesting but very often an overlooked aspect of imperial tradition. But, um, 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 the, the question behind it also centers on um, um, the making, well, the complicated mechanism between locale and the center. To what extent, for instance, um, visions of local elites about rituals and symbols about performance and aesthetics can be um, reported to Beijing, to the center, for instance, in imperial times and 20th century and present. Um, the third, um, my third question, um, my third question concerns the relationship between political aesthetics on the one hand and discursive legitimation on the other hand. I think today you started your lecture um, with that and the paper is also um, uh, um, helping us, walking us through the two fantastic themes. On the one hand, it is ideology, it is discursive legitimation. Um, we can think of communism as a way of legitimating regimes, Confucianism, arguably, liberal democracy, etc. These are kind of discursive models, frameworks of making sense of regimes, making sense of governance and legitimating that. It is wonderful that you direct our attention to another aspect, as you have mentioned, it is about the lived experience of being governed. I'm wondering how these two realms are interrelated uh, definitely an uh, imperial aesthetics, political aesthetics of empire also employed discursive tools. How is, how is discursive tools important then? How is theorization important then? How is convincing, well, convincing others important then? Another dimension of the argument is, um, is this a philosophical one. Ultimately, should the regime find a comprehensive theory to legitimize itself, theorize itself, to make itself um, solid. Or it is possible to set aside, for instance, communist theory, liberal democratic theory, etc. And instead, let's result to rhetoric, symbols, rituals, the transformative power of these performance, so that the regime can circumvent the pivotal question, should we democratize or should we endorse certain other ideologies? I think this is um, something I'm really curious about. And last but not least, my last question concerns the closing section um, of your paper. You mentioned imperial aesthetics is not um, unique to China. In the contemporary world, in our global politics, it is something that is also there with the Russian Soviet Union empire, with the Ottoman empire, with the British empire, with American empire in a certain sense. This accuracy resonates with my first question. Do you think, um, um, for instance, Xunzi theory or musical resonance, to what extent do you think it helps us to make sense of these mechanisms um, of ritual, 
symbols, imperial aesthetics in the context of these empires. But more importantly, critically, um, what I'm most curious about is what you think about the contemporary global politics in which not only we have multiple empires, but each empire has its own imperial aesthetics and their technology is in dialogue, in circulation with each other. You have 5G, you have mobile, you have app in one state that circulate to others. But on the other hand, they have their own imperial nostalgia. They have their own, they are kind of utilizing these imperial discourses in their own way and competing for global hegemon. So the question put differently is what do you think, what is the implication of the plurality of not only empires, but also imperial aesthetics as governing technologies? What is the implication of such kind of global agnostic kind of competition mean for us? So um, to recapitulate uh, my four questions, sorry, it's, uh, it is not as clear as it should be, can be recapitulating the following way. It's, more, it's first about resonance as a theory or method. And second, it, is con it concerns resonance as a mechanism, how it works. And third, it concerns resonance versus legitimation. Can resonance aesthetics in the end replace certain discursive legitimation in a way that halt, for instance, liberal democratization movements. And the fourth, it concerns resonance in global politics um, and its implication for us and for the future. I have um, already talked too much. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. What an honor. It would be great, yeah, if we can learn more from you. Fu, thank you so very much. That's very thoughtful engagement and uh, questions that I am glad that I'm not having to answer. The, but we will uh, turn them over to, uh, to Vivian uh, and uh, let her have a start to respond. And then I would like to point out to our guests in the webinar today, please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A and we will, uh, we will uh, try to engage every one of them as much as we can. And so Vivian, maybe some first thoughts in response to uh, uh, Shofu's very interesting uh, points. Well, these are not only just interesting questions. These are the big, really, really tough questions that are left um, unaddressed. Uh, uh, and for everyone to think about, I mean, thank you, uh, Shofu, for, for posing such big questions, because I do believe that the SA I know that I meant the essay in part to provoke some of these really big questions in, in our minds, all our minds, and I have by no means settled on, on, on the answers. Um, I'm still exploring, and like you, listening to um, evolving expressions of imperial um, nostalgia and um, the forms that takes and what kind of politics that produces uh, in the globe that we do all share. Um, so I think I was partly motivated to try to do this for China, which is um, the only country I feel I have some deep expertise about, um, in part because of what was going on in my homeland in the United States. You mentioned Trump and the sort of use of, um, of resonant concepts there, which had been um, buried uh, in for long periods of my existence and had re-emerged to view in ways that I certainly hadn't anticipated. Um, and and watching that occur and watching it resonate with so many other people uh, in that country um, made me wonder if I had thought enough about these non-material aesthetic, uh, aesthetic elements in the experience of being governed um, that, you, that you raise and, um, and how, they, how these elements find their way into our hearts and minds and why they are able to pluck a string um, and get us to respond uh, and uh, resonate um, uh, 
uh, when when we are touched by them. Um, so yes, um, the, I, 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 what I have to say is maybe I hope unlocking a little bit that realm of research and rethinking um, that I have felt for so long that um, students of politics like me uh, really have been ignorant of, ignored at, and and deliberately ignored, downplayed, and um, put beyond the, the the realm of what we thought we needed to grapple with, and um, instead um, uh, put that front and center now and ask ourselves these these questions about how we are ruled and how others are ruled and the ways in which they share. Um, basic conceptions and the ways in which they don't. So I do mean it to spread, if possible, to other, um, to the study of other political systems, uh, and not only the ones that were former empires, but the ones that are empires today, like the United States, for example. Um, so, yeah, but your questions, um, so that maybe is a little bit of a, a a response to your question, your last question about what this has to do with global politics today. Um, your next to last question was about whether I think um, resonance as a political phenomenon, if I understood your question, and please jump in and, co and co correct me if I didn't get it all correctly. Um, I, I welcome you. Uh, jumping in and clarifying because I may have not taken in everything you're trying to express. Um, but that was about whether theory can be replaced, I think, whether resonance can replace theory. Um, not in China. I mean, I don't think so. I mean, uh, people like um, Timothy Brooke would be out of work if that were the case. There would be no theory to uh, uh, to aspire to uh, record and and penetrate and, uh, and comprehend, um, the party and and certainly Xi Jinping, uh, uh, like every one of the political leaders of the of the communist past, has thought it very important to codify its thought, and indeed to sum it up ritually um, and regularly and draw lessons from it and and use those as as guides for the next phase uh, uh, and i don't expect that to change at all there is a an accretion to this to this thought that that occurs um and again comparing to western countries um that there isn't such a conscious uh, appeal to that accretion over time of experience and 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 enlightened um, understanding of our experience. Uh, instead, there tends to be more an appeal to basic principles um, and going back and unlocking what basic principles were. The Chinese Communist Party is progressive in the sense that it wishes to um, to build on its own experience, learn from it, and and presumes it can, from summing up these experiences, unlock better solutions to new problems it will encounter uh, ahead of it. Um, so no, I don't think theory goes away at all um, in this. But I think there's a distinction to be made between what mo what is imagined to motivate ordinary members of society to be on the same page with the party state and what is needed to motivate those who are thinkers and involved in in thought at a at a higher level i think resonance works for everyone but it's absolutely essential and maybe the basic a uh, way of trying to um to instigate um support um from most people in society. Everyone is is capable of being touched um, by that. But some people need more um, than just a sense of, of belonging and being moved and and pride and identification with um, with a political system. They need 
they need an ideology they need to understand its theory and and i think both of these are understood by the communist party as essential components along with good organization so ideology organization and the ability to resonate and reach people where they live in their hearts um these are all um key aspects of governing as i do think um party leaders today uh, um understand their their tasks um now i'm not sure um that's the best i can do it unless you come back at me for on on that topic but uh the the, the question before that was about mechanisms and i'm not sure that I really, I think it was about mechanisms. Um, and were you asking me to try to trace the mechanisms by which, by which what? So there are mechanisms by which what happens? So um, to give an example, right, uh, see his vision. Um, and then he will not orchestrate that vision in terms of, um, for instance, how the opening should be like. And he will then rely on this and that person, right, to design this and that, right? And together mm -hmm. they will make um, something that will touch upon the audience. And I'm curious about how the cooperation is possible and how that might work. For instance, um, I am an artist, for instance, um, in one way or another, am I participating in the power? Not necessary, right? But on the other hand, there's a cadre. I do not know how their taste is like. But in the end, the result we see is something in the end that touches us, right? The question right. is, um, to put in another way, is how, how it reaches us. How is a kind of resonance okay. manufactured? It's not accurate what, how it's made. Yeah. Um, I don't know because I'm not inside the system enough to give you a real answer for that. However, um, there you've mentioned two types of two types of situations. Um, one, you said, if I'm a cadre, how do I know? Uh, if I, how do I understand? And how is it I come to be touched by this? I mean, I think there is a really um, intense use of um, of teaching uh, that goes on within the communist party and down to its cadres teaching is um is is what so much of what party activity is really about it's learning the new um points for special attention that have been floated to the surface and they are driven home again and again and again. And you'd have to be a bit of a dullard if you've made it into the party, not to be able to see which way the discourse is going, where the theory is headed, which are the five or four or six or 12 main points uh, of the day that you need to be uh, on top of and, and understand and apply and show that you've been able to apply in your work. So, I mean, within the party, all the way down to um, the lowest level uh, cadres is continuous meetings and discussions and summaries of of what of, of what we think and study of what the 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 leaders have said especially the central leader um so that reading and rereading and discussing uh and synthesizing the lessons to be learned is the main and then being caused yourself also to have to write up reports that show the ways in which you have made use of these very important messages that have come from the center and responded to them. This is the way of, this is the stuff of party life, I think. And, um, and so it's not hard to see how that happens um, within the party. Um, for other people, ordinary folk who have no um who, who haven't got that kind of intense exposure to this po political messaging um i think they are exposed to it um i think they're aware that it's a good idea 
to be uh, awake uh, and pay that much attention, at least to know what the mantras of the day are and to try to bring those um, and try to be responsive to those. They know they're not expected um, to um, invent new ideas. They only need to be alert to what the messages of the moment are. And I think you learn that as a way of being a citizen or a subject in the Chinese polity in just the way you would learn in, say, in Canadian life, that more than just knowing what the main theories of the day are, you're probably expected to have something critical to say about it. Um, that latter part is less essential. It's not ruled out, but it's less essential in China. And I think that's a way of being governed um, that uh, is learned um, early on also. I, 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 there, I have many other thoughts about, about this, um, how, how we convey these political aesthetics that I think are at work in all of our lives, um, how they're conveyed from person to person and from, from leader to led and from generation to generation. This is um, something that needs, you know, I think much more close, um, close examination than we we tend to give it to to give it i think we reproduce these i think language is extremely important and i uh in in which in in the language that we that we use I, um is buried you know so many key ideas just just if you take the the chung, the the, the 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 cliches or common sayings everyday knowledge um, and what gets quoted, this, this brings with it, you know, I mean, take something like, uh, like spring drizzle, uh, you know, coming, uh, falling without a sound. I mean, this comes from a classical poem, but it becomes, uh, from the Tang Dynasty, but it becomes an, an everyday phrase that, that people use, right? It's a chung almost. And then it's, it's, tells you, it expresses, if you hear it when you are four years old and 10 years old and 20 years old, it expresses an ideal of um, transmission of life force that um, uh, affects how you think about how the universe works and how society works. And so, and these are not unique to different cultures. There's many, many places in which there are, you know, similar, similar um, kinds of notions that we can find at play. And yet a particular assemblage of these languages and uh, common knowledges um, and expecta known expectations uh, from people as citizens constitute the whole of what it's like to be the experience of being governed and understanding it, it as being governed um, in in different political cultures. Um, have I answered all your questions? No. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm so. gonna I'm gonna let you uh, take it offline, uh, so to speak, with with because uh, okay. it sounds because like you're the beginning of a great conversation, and uh, my head is spinning from it too. But I've got another triple header coming right at you here. The um, which is to say my colleague uh, Ren Ren Yang uh, from our Department of Asian Studies has posted uh, three very interesting questions. And we, I, I think I can see his face up here. So I, uh, Ren Ren, you wanna come on and I think you can ask your question yourself. Okay, great. Could you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Shu. This is very, very inspiring. Um, so uh, as you can see from the chat, I posted my three questions there. Um, I'm very, very interested. First of all, I'm very intrigued by and impressed by the notion of resonance, which is also an important notion for me to look at um, literary celebrity in my own studies. But here, my questions are more historical. So first, I would like to hear your comments on the KMT's time-space ordering in the Republican era. I'm thinking about- Sorry, the, the, the comment the, on the KMT. The KMT's time-space ordering in the Republican era. 
and I'm thinking about their emphasis on Confucian ethos in the New Life movement, for example. And this is the, the first question. And the second question is about the possible uh, modernity of socialist move, uh, socialist uh, era, socialist period, or um, can we think about being being modern by being anti-modern? I mean, there is some paradoxical um, 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 rhetoric there, or we have never been modern, right? And that that is the second question. And the third question is about uh, the persistence of ritual economy. Um, this is, um, I, I just uh, um, heard a talk um, by Professor Mayfair Yang from UCSB, and she published a book on the persistence of ritual economy based on her fieldwork in Wenzhou. And she talked about how such, um, um, such ritual economy, not, not just in um, um, rural China, but also in other parts of uh, Asia, Taiwan, and East, East, uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. So I'm thinking about the, the, the relationship or the tension between this top-down um, conception of um, ritual and this grassroots practice of ritual. Sometimes they are in concord, but sometimes there are um, interesting yeah. tension there, right? Because CCP um, also uh, alleges to, to, to root out the superstitious mm. element and so on. But, but eventually this um, ritual economy contributes to a neoliberal development. So- um, so I'm, neoliberal, I'm, did you neoliberal, say neoliberal? Neoliberal economy or neoliberal capitalism, right? Ritual economy um, oh. becomes a very important and productive force in the Wenzhou model um, for, for its economic development. So I'm thinking about the uncomfortable tension, but also perhaps some sort of synergy between the CCP's reign and the folk uh, level time space as well. So I'm, I'm grappling with that. that, that and tension. the what level? The, 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 the folk, the, 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 the grassroots folk level. level. The, the, yeah, just some, something top down or something button up there. And thank you so much. <laughs> oh. Wow, I think um, maybe there's a book there, um, or two books, and what you you said, um, and these are big questions, which again I can't I can't answer. I let me just say something about um, Mayfair Young, whose work I also um, greatly greatly uh, value. Um, I haven't seen this new book, but uh, the persistence of the ritual economy um, is, is sounds like a fascinating work, and she's just the one to have done it. Um, it, it, you, it. If I took you, if I understood what you were saying correctly, in this work she shows that there is a conflict, can be conflict, between the folk local ritual uh, economy and the agenda of the folk and uh, the uh, ritual that um, uh, emerges from from the center, and uh, um, I, this leads me to a position which I probably should have articulated a little bit early, uh, better earlier on, which is um, that within I firmly believe, and I think Mayfair must be trying to show this in her work and and demonstrate how she's how she's observed it in her in her research that ritual, like anything else, um, can be modified um, to suit different political agendas and can be paired up against uh, other ways of approaching ritual. Um, and there can be contestation over the nature of the ritual, the content of it, the real meaning of it, the proper way to do it, and what it, and, and, and what the outcome um, for different parties involved from the ritual really is and or ought to be. And within this framework of ritual or rites uh, or even resonance can be non-resonant uh, elements, right? very uh, dissonant elements occurring which reflect ongoing political struggles, different political agendas, power agendas um, of the people all 
in one sense, sharing the same experience and in the other sense, taking away something very different uh, from it or seeking to have something validated in it, uh, which is different from what others uh, others see and prefer uh, to freight it with, so to speak. So this, um, the fact that, you know, that there is, um, that I speak a lot about ritual does not mean that I, I see this as, um, as written in stone, right? Ritual is a live, uh, a live enterprise, as anyone who lives within the Catholic Church, for example, can tell you. Uh, I think it does not; it is not something that was set down in the in the Bible uh, and never um, and never modified or thought, rethought, or renegotiated. Uh, in again after that and it i i think if we approach it that way um as something with a very long history which allows for ma many different interpretations and many different manipulations uh we'll come closer to understanding its um enlivening possibilities really uh, uh, rather than its deadening possibilities, which is one way uh, routinely, I think, too much we we assume that's what ritual is about. About the Guomindang, uh, I, I wish um, I had studied more about the Guomindang. I know I have a few um, a few quick thoughts about that, which are in the paper. Um, um, my basic thought is that the 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 Guomindang adopted a more completely tried to adopt a more completely modern more western modernist inspired aesthetic and and uh was very interested in purging as much as it could um uh, of uh of residual elements of traditional culture as well. Now, the New Life Movement is 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 is, a, is another matter, perhaps, but um, but it, it's sought to catch up and um, to use very bold uh, uh, and very explicitly modernistic um, stylistics in 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 what it. In, in what it was able to build and it was able to build more so it was able to do it had access um, to places and to funds uh, and um, to peace uh, peaceful locations where it was possible for it to construct much more and so I see we see we see that in 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 what's left of its constructions but um um but I don't think you know had they won um had they ended up governing the mainland, um, I'm not sure whether that would have persevered. That uh, that continuous hope of mimicking the modern, the modern, the new modern, uh, other uh, in other parts of the world. I'm not sure it would have, when faced with the prospects, with the with the with the the the, the, the problems of, of governing uh, a country that was still in such uh, a um, an undeveloped and and uh, Ill illiterate uh, state of being when when uh, the civil war came to an end, um, so I I need to re I need to think more about this and read more about it. I've recently been in dialogue with Steve Smith, historian here at Oxford, and he tells me that I have um, in this paper he thinks overplayed. The, dis the difference between um, the Guomindang and the, and the CCP at, at that period of wartime, and there were more similarities there than I allow of in my in my um, in my discussion. So I have much more to learn about that. Um, was there a third question? We're going to let it. We're going to let it rest. <laughs> uh, and, and, and because of my sense of uh, ritual democracy. And our time is coming up, but we've got a final question from Clara White. And uh, so I wanted you to get a little more variety. Ren Ren, I hope you'll, you'll be in further contact uh, with Vivian, because I think you have a good, good conversation. If I, missed, uh, if I missed the subtleties of your question, you are both, uh, you are all invited to write to me and uh, by email and, and, and say again, and I'll do my best to get a better answer to you. Great. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Clara, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. Um, oh, you, can, you, can, you can ask them both, but you might only get one. <laughs> okay, so uh, my first question is, um, at the end of your article, you mention the presently waning US-led world empire, according to his analysis, now faces three great unsolvable problems the ever-increasing inequality created by the liberal global economy, state failure, political decline, and ineffective governance caused by political liberalism, <clears throat> and decadence and nihilism caused by Western cultural liberalism. And mm -hmm. as he concludes, the civilization that is able to provide genuine solutions to these, great, to these three great problems will also provide the blueprint for the new world empire that is to come. So in fact, with its globally promote, promoted concept of ecological civilization, that actually includes environmental, but also cultural dimensions, China is working very hard at the moment at promoting such solutions at a global level. So, <clears throat> and also at uh, renewing political economics and political and, and economic theory and political theory. So my first question was, what do you think of the Chinese e um, political agenda based on ecological civilization and the environmental and cultural values that it is promoting? Then my second question um, uh, states as such, um, the Western world unfortunately has come to promote culture as mainly yet another commercial product as such, culture is often associated with vacuity, if not vulgarity, and mere spectacle. This we find, for example, in the book, uh, The Civilization of Spectacle by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa, the uh, Nobel Prize of Literature from Peru. And <clears throat> this uh, culture does not provide the sublimation that human beings need to elevate themselves above selfishness and promote values of life rather than death. Um, so in his book, Psychoanalyst Erich Firm, in his book, um, The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness, suggests that to sort out this problem and promote more life values or what he calls a biophilist ethic, ethics, sorry, we should get back to value and teach the great humanists. And in fact, in our own tradition, in the Western traditions, uh, many philosophers such as Plato or even Augustine um, showed how music, harmony, etc., could in fact promote good political and moral values, good political order, etc. So that's very close to uh, the Confucian values that you were mentioning previously. So my question for you is, how do you think we as Westerners should work on our side to restore good cultural values for ourselves so that we can come up with our own solutions um, that will provide, as, as stated in your article, the blueprint. Thank you, thank you very the much, the, uh, Clara. Thank you. That'll work. That'll work. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time, but those are two very powerful questions. And let's see what uh, Vivian can do. Okay, Clara, thank you so much for preparing uh, such uh, deep and good questions. Um, you uh, and the first one you were quoting um, Jiang Shigong. Just to be clear, that was not um, that was not Xi Jinping who said those things. That comes from an article by Jiang Shigong, one of his very close uh, advisors and someone that who probably helps him think through his positions uh, on on important matters. Um, you touch on it on a on a, yeah. I mean, there is explicit discussion of empire there and of competition um, for the place of the new most mm, most influential world empire um, it's uh, and that one the one that will provide the blueprint uh, for the coming world order i think obviously Zhang shogong thinks uh, that this will be china that uh, that China has what it takes uh, in its culture and um, in its intelligence and its accomplishments and its proficiency um, at, at governing uh, and many other things um, to to assume that position. 
which of course sets the matter in a competitive in, in a competitive frame um but when you raise the question then of ecological civilization i see that as um an articulation of a possible um ground we in different world empires global empires can possibly share on which we can possibly agree and i think this is one of the areas in which um chinese thinkers maybe not zhang shugong among them but those who think a little bit less competitively and and about survival of the planet um think about how they can make outreach to the west in constructive ways um and ecological civilization is a i think it's a platform uh intended as a platform on which people from all kinds of cultures not just west and east but also indigenous cultures can find a way find ways to engage with others globally um to save ourselves from the destruction and annihilation that we're otherwise all headed for yes and so i see that as a form of outreach um to other cultures um and i it may not be confusion in its in its basis it may be drawing much more on taoist inspirations right um which are not unlike some of those shared in many other many other indigenous cultures around the world so um that's where i think that's coming from and maybe where it could be headed if it's greeted with um appropriate um appropriate uh, welcome um, Vivian, Vivian, we're going yeah, so to Vivian, we're gonna have to. Yeah, so I think perhaps time. We're going to have to stop with that one, because in ninety seconds we'll automatically turn off. We've set ourselves a an iron discipline that I should have made more clear at the beginning. I think Clara has set you on an answer that ends us on a positive note. Uh, that the possibility of some, uh, dare I say, positive resonances around the world uh, within this uh, political aesthetic. I want to thank you so very much, and I want to thank uh, Clara and Renren for excellent questions, and especially, of course, Yin Shoufu for a very thoughtful uh, commentary uh, today. And um, you'll see up on the screen, um, if you are interested in this topic and the further developments of it in a fortnight, it'll be Friday the 25th of February, where you welcome uh, Yuhua Wang from Harvard on the rise and fall of Imperial China and the social origins of state development with commentary from Kerry Brown in King's College London. And so I hope you will all join me in thanking Vivian Xu and Shoufu Yin for taking us another step forward so wonderfully. Thank you, Tim. Okay, thank you so very much. <laughs>